You know, God is truly on the move, man. Let me tell you something. There are things happening. Happening quickly. One of the things we want to do is be sensitive to what God is saying, what he's doing. As we were praising and worshiping tonight, I had a vision. And in the vision, you know, last year, uh, or, or I think it was last year. Anyways, I had a vision a while ago, and what I saw was waves coming. And in these waves, there were people rolling up in the waves, and they were coming to the shore. And when they got to the shore, they stood up straight. And as more and more people were being rolled, as the waves kept coming in, they would hit the shore, and they would stand up straight. And they began to lock arms. And, and one of the things that the Lord was sharing was that it was about his children who were becoming warriors. And in this, many have either gone astray or they've been washed or gone through many trials and tribulations. But in this, they began to roll like almost that they were, they were brought back to life again and refreshing. And as they hit the shore, they stood up. And as they stood up, they began to lock arms together in unity. And the Spirit was saying that there was going to be a unity in his kingdom, in his body, more and more of a unity. And tonight I saw waves coming. And I kept seeing these waves coming. And I saw, uh, like, uh, glittering. And I thought, I thought it was gold at first. And he said, no. Then I began to look closer. And they were weapons. And, and in this, he said, now that my children have hit the shores, I'm now going to bring my strategies. I'm now going to bring my tactics to be able to infiltrate Satan's kingdom. So all of these things are rolling up right now. They're coming. That's why the word tells us that knowledge would increase, but only the, uh, not only the knowledge and technology of the world, but the revelations from God would increase. That there'd be more insight of what's happening. That there'd be more open doors and more ports opening in the eternal realm where there'd be more revelation and impartations. There'll be more of a thirst and hunger. But he said, this will be established as my people are planted. As they are planted. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about tonight is called the planting of the Lord. And the, and the, and the, arena, and the purpose of God's planting. Hallelujah. Would you turn to, turn to John 16? <laughs> John 16. Planting of the Lord. So everybody at John 16. And verse 7. Let's speak it together. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. And that's what's happening right now. In the area that God's spirit is being poured out in a mighty way. In all areas, God, no one comes to the Father unless he is being drawn. 
And in this, he has released his spirit so that we would have truth, be guided to all truth, and that there would be revelation. In other words, he was telling them, you can't receive what I have for you yet. But see, now is the time. Now is the time because he's the one that gives us the ears to hear. Amen? As we ask, Lord, open my ears to hear, my eyes to see, and my heart to receive and obey. Go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In other words, all that is his is ours, so that means he's trying to get something to us, isn't he? So if all of these individuals that had rolled up and were on the shore, ran off of the shore, and now all of these weapons and strategies are coming, would they be able to get them? No, that's why it's important to be implanted. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, let's speak it. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So how are things going to get to me and you? Through the spirit. Has everybody got it? It's through the spirit. That's why if you're not in the spirit, you can't receive the things of the Spirit. So what he does is he waits for you to get in the Spirit. He waits for you to be separated. He waits for your carnal mind to get behind you because he knows that anything he tries to plant to you will be stolen. It will not infiltrate or not penetrate. It's gone. Amen? So there's that place where he knows he waits for you. He waits for me and you to get into that place to be able to receive. Amen? Go to Isaiah 61. So Jesus said, I, all the things my Father has given to me, I give to the Spirit who gives to you. Amen? Amen? And then he says, listen, the only way you're going to get these things is to get in the Spirit. <laughs> now, in Isaiah 61 and verse 1, I want everyone to proclaim this. 61 verse 1. We're all going to proclaim this together. Amen? Is everybody ready? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Now, has everybody got this? So what does it take to get this? You must be planted. Amen? You must be what? Planted. This is the planting of the Lord. Look at all the things that he's trying to get to us. The Spirit of the Lord who brings and delivers all of these things. There must be a planting. Verse 4. This is what's going to happen then. As we are planted, what will we do? They shall what? Rebuild the old ruins. They shall rise up the former desolations. They shall repair the ruined cities. The desolations of many just generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flock. The sons of the foreigner shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But you shall be named the priests of the Lord. They shall call you the servants of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall boast. 
Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. And instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in your portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery for burnt offering. I will direct their work in truth and will make with them an everlasting covenant. Their descendants shall be known among the Gentiles and their offspring among the people. All who see them shall acknowledge them, that they are prosperity whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Now this is powerful, because what's he talking about? The planting of his people, as they are planted, and the Spirit comes upon them, because it's called positioning. Planting is positioning. Is everybody all right? This is why God plants you in fellowship to rebuild, to restore, to open doors of the prisons, to go forth and declare the year of the Lord. It is like a garden. Amen. When we are planted, we are planted like a garden. Go to Genesis 2. Genesis 2 and verse 7. Hallelujah. See, now you just decreed that over yourself. Do you understand that? Don't let the enemy steal it. Genesis 2 verse 7. Let's speak it together. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, so we see that God planted a garden, and who did he put in there? Man whom he planted. Man whom he created. He planted and put him in there, didn't he? Amen. So God planted a garden place, Adam in it, to provide all he needed. Amen. To grow, to mature, to become strong. Then, of course, he provided a helper. Amen. When he brought forth his wife. In this place of planting all things are provided. There's something else that happened. Adam and Eve were covered with the glory of God. Well, and, and God provided the right food for them to eat. And eternal life food. Amen. But when they got deceived and ate junk food. Hello. Hello. How many of y'all know you can eat junk food by touching the green what the devil says? Isn't that what happened to Eve? What happened then? When they ate junk food, it moved them out of position. Amen? It moved them right out of position. Once they disobeyed, not only did it move them out of the position, but they lost their covering. Then they tried to cover themselves with leaves. And it didn't work. Go to Genesis 3. Let 
once disobeyed, they lost the covering and had to be covered by the Lord. And the training that God had for them in the garden, he was providing. Now the training that they would have to go through would be through suffering. Genesis 3. Is everybody there? Is everybody okay? Oh, hallelujah. Genesis 3, 7. It says, And the eyes of both of them were open after they ate a junk food. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Amen? <laughs> and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Remember, something else happened that Remember, they used to talk to God face to face. Amen? So now they became blind to the spirit realm. They were deceived, and they were afraid. Remember, Satan's greatest weapon is deception, and his power is fear. Then the Lord God called to Adam like he didn't know where he was, right? And he said to him, where are you at, man? And, he, and Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And the Lord said, who told you that? What happened? Adam ate junk food. Everybody got it. He ate junk food, didn't he? Why? Because of what the voice of the stranger did. <laughs> Have you eaten from the junk food tree I told you not to? Then Adam blamed his wife. <laughs> Adam said, the woman whom you gave me, who you gave me. She gave me that junk food. She said it was homemade. The recipe was from hell. So the Lord said, and then, of course, Adam, and then the woman said, well, the serpent did it. The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Okay, and the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all, all the beasts of the field, and on your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life, and I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. Everything was going to be about s suffering now. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desires shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it, curses the ground for your sake, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for dust you are, and dust you shall return. Nice, huh? And Adam called his wife named Eve because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin. And he clothed them. In other words, this was the first sacrifice. So God showed Adam and Eve how to recover, kill an animal. Amen? So the Lord killed an animal, took the skin of the animal, and wrapped it around Adam and Eve. Then the Lord said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Knowing good and evil and becoming good and evil is two different things. God never intended for man to become evil. He intended them for to learn what it was about. That's why the serpent was in the garden. So everybody got it. So God was going to train them. Amen. Through the things in the garden. But because they ate junk food, they ate of the serpent's recipe. They became junk themselves. Amen? 
They became blind. They became deceived. They became fearful. And God was not going to allow them to eat the tree of life and be that way all of their days. So he opened the door to death. That was the opportunity to leave the evil. Amen? So the Lord said that the man had become like us, and now lest he put out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life because God did not want them to live forever. Junk food moves you out of position. You know, what happens is when God plants us in somewhere in a fellowship or whatever, the purpose of that is to eat right food. And sometimes, you know, I'm not going to go heavily into this, but we've got to be careful what we're eating. You know, there are places where I, I've, I've heard things that I'm like, man, you know what? That's junk food. That's junk food. And people are walking out of position. Listen, you can be planted in one place and still go eat somewhere else and receive junk food. And what happens then, it promotes rebellion. I'm going to say this again. Junk food promotes rebellion. For us to be trained correctly, God plants us in a place to eat the right food for training. But when we begin to eat other food, junk food, what it does is it brings deception, division, separation, and rebellion. The planting of the Lord establishes three factors. It's the abiding factor, the fear factor, and the truth factor. And of course, we know in the abiding factor, we're to abide in his presence with worship, abide in his word with prayer, Amen? And abide in his fellowship of the body. That's the abiding factor. His presence, his word of prayer, and fellowship. And of course, we have the fear factor. And the fear factor is the fear of the Lord. And in this, it means reverence, honor, and respect. Reverence, honor, and respect. And then, of course, we have the truth factor. And that is to know the truth, live the truth, and practice the truth. That means knowing him. Because he is truth. When we declare truth to someone, what we're doing is introducing them to Jesus. Because he is truth. Truth is not, look at, truth is a person who brings knowledge. And has everybody got it? That's why Jesus was said, I am the way, the truth, and the life because he is the eternal truth that brings truth, that sets us free because, not because we know it, but because we practice it and live it because truth is life. Amen? <clears throat> All these lead, these three factors it, it leads and promotes like-mindedness. Everyone say like-mindedness. Because when we become like-mindedness, it diffuses rebellion. Well, first, we want to be like-minded with the Spirit, don't we? When we're like, if everybody's like-minded with the Spirit, rebellion is exposed, isn't it? Amen. So as we are like-minded with the Spirit, then we're like-minded with each other. That's what God is doing right now. Why? Because all of these things that are being brought up by the waves of His presence, the waves of His glory, are releasing strategies, tactics, weapons, 
more insight of things that are happening. And he's trying to release them to all of his children because it's being released through the Spirit. And if you have the mind of Christ and you are cooperating with the mind of Christ, these things will be imparted in you. But there are the three factors that must be maintained. Abide, fear, and truth. And it will all be with him because he is the truth. Amen? Again, all of these things, these three factors always leads and promotes like-mindedness. Like-mindedness will diffuse rebellion. Why? Because you'll be able to discern it. Amen? And what you can't see, somebody else will. Jeremiah 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. In verse 23. Somebody there? Oh, hallelujah. Did I say chapter 10? How about 9? <laughs> Some things just don't change. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. Let's speak it together. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Not, let, not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. Now, this is powerful because what is he saying? Let a man delight in what? Understanding and knowing him. And the only way you're going to do that is to be in the spirit because God is spirit. And it's going to take us to be planted because when we are planted, then God begins to move in areas. Why? Because there's something that's happening. We are earning trust. Has everybody got it? We are earning what? Amen. Because, <laughs> see, everything that you do, we're always earning trust. God is tr testing us and checking us out to see if he can trust us. Those, the, the Bible also says that those who know him will do great exploits. Go to Luke 8. Verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts. Lest they should believe and be what? Why? Why is this so easy for the devil to do? Because the person is not what? planted but the ones on the rock are those who when they hear receive the word with joy and these have no root no what why because they're not planted who believe for a while and in the time of temptation fall away now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who when they have heard go out and are choked with what 
cares, riches, and pleasures of life, bringing no fruit to maturity. Why? Not planted. Amen. Has everybody got this? But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word, with a noble and good heart, in other words, humble, keep it and bear fruit with what? Patience or endurance. Has everybody got this? You know, if when people are not planted, it is very difficult. There are people who jump from one church to another, to another, to another. To, they're not planted. But they want to be used. God will not use a person that's not planted because he can't trust them. Has everybody got it? He can't trust them. I'm telling you, there are people that jump from one place to another place to another place to another place. They don't know where they're going. They want to go out and do all things for God, but God's not sending them. See, th there are things that are good, but are not God. And in this, God is always associated with his timing. If it's not his timing, it's not his will. And if you move out of God's timing and not of his will, you move out of his covering. Amen? Praise God. 1 Peter chapter 5. So what happens is people move from one garden to another. <laughs> the problem is, is there, and, and, listen, if you are not planted in the right place and eating the right food, you are eating junk food. You cannot be what you want to be. You must be what he wants you to be. Has everybody got it? See, people see all kinds of people and what they're doing in ministry. That's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. You know what I wanted to do? My wife was a traveling nurse. I just wanted to go on corners and preach. We were going to travel. I was going to get to Harley and go. Pfft. But I've been here for 18 years. <laughs> here in Okoe. <laughs> but I don't care. Because it's not my life. I live his life in this place. I don't live my life anymore. And I'm joyful. And I'm content. And I'm fulfilled with him. Because that's all that matters. And I get a front row seat to watch life's change. I'm telling you, it's like going to a movie. <laughs> what entertainment than to watch the hand of God. But yes, I, I, I did not plan on um, being a pastor. I didn't plan on having homes. I didn't, that was not my plan at all. But praise God. I'm glad I didn't do my plan. <laughs> First Peter chapter 5. Oh, hallelujah. Now, the purpose of the planting is for training for raining. Has everybody got it? The purpose of the planting is training for raining. In verse 8, it says what? Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may what? Hello. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have what? After you have suffered a while. Why? Because you're going to be trained through your suffering. You're going to learn obedience. You know, God exposes your enemies through your suffering also. Then he says, after you suffered a while, after you got trained a little bit. <laughs> uh, he'll, he'll perfect you. 
He'll establish you. He'll strengthen you. And then he'll settle you. And then he'll repeat it. <laughs> Man, you don't get up the stair without going through the cycle. It's a part of training. You know, so many times when people are not planted correctly and they go through it, they go through it because of the area where God is trying to get them back in position. There's a difference between suffering of training and, and chastisement. There are people that are out of order. And, and, and I see them and they, and they boast in the area, well, I'm just suffering for the Lord. I want to tell them, you're just out of order, you bonehead. You're not suffering for the Lord. It's called self-martyrism. And you're full of pride. And you think that you're suffering for the Lord. When you're out of position, you're not suffering for the Lord. You're suffering because you're being chastened. So you can get in position and get the right sufferings of the Lord for training. Amen? <laughs> See, we need to be strengthened, don't we? We need to be settled so we're not moved. Well, that's going to happen when we become like-minded. So everything that God is doing again right now is bringing us into an arena of like-mindedness. John 10. Hallelujah. Ooh, cool. <laughs> All right. And verse 1. Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a what? Robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep what? Hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. The problem is, is we know more voices of the stranger than we do the sheep. I mean, than the shepherd. Amen? And this is why we must become like-minded, so we know the voice of God. And let me share something with you. God does not always speak with a voice. He speaks with an impression. A majority of the time, he speaks with vision. The problem is, is people aren't seeing. So he's got to visit them in a dream. Or, you, you know, some other way through somebody else or whatever. But in this, it's important that we begin to learn a voice. You cannot grab hold of the voice of God if you are not planted. If you are not planted, you will be always go astray because the familiar spirit comes and imitates the voice of God. And the familiar spirit always promotes good, but not God. Has everybody got it? See, because anything that has to do with God is according to his time and his will. Amen? But the familiar spirit always likes to promote the things of God, but it's not God's time. That's why people marry out of time. That's why people get jobs out of time. That's why they do many things out of God's time. And they find themselves in trouble. Then they have to work things out. And instead of being trained up in all kinds of... They have to now work things out. It's so like when somebody gets in debt. So the enemy loves to put people in debt. How many of y'all know that? So what happens is if he can get you in debt enough... 
then you spend more time trying to get out of debt than serving the Lord. These are the enemy's tactics, isn't it? I mean, we're, we're all part of that in the world. But now that we're out of the world, we're separated from the world, and we need to be planted and be steadfast. One of the things that the Lord is looking for is faithfulness. It is essential. You cannot be planted if you are not faithful. Amen? So the Lord desires his sheep to be trained up to hear and understand his voice. It allows us to submit to authority, maintain order, and serve one another. Amen? When we are out of order, we serve our own and not the Lord. Leviticus 10. The planting of the Lord. You know, Jesus gave the, always gave the examples. Look at what happened when Jesus showed up on the scene. He went to the disciples. He said, follow me. He didn't even say, believe me. Amen? He said, follow me. Why? Because knew, they knew he couldn't believe them. So he said, follow me first. And as you follow me, you're going to end up believing me. See, people want to, they have this tendency that they must believe first before they follow. It's like people waiting for a feeling first. See, truth is not a feeling. Truth is truth, and that's just all up to it. If you practice the truth, you'll get free. If you're waiting for the feeling to be free, you won't be free. Does everybody got it? God is not the God of feeling. He is the God of truth. And Leviticus 10. And that's what messes up a lot of people because they're still looking for the feeling. Hallelujah. Verse 1. Let's speak this together, please. The Nadab... And Abelu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So were they out of order? So fire went out from the Lord and what? Well, what you sow is what you reap. <laughs> and they died <laughs> before the Lord. Amen? And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as what? Holy. Now, let me ask you this. These are the three factors, aren't they? The abiding factor, the fear factor, and the truth factor. And before all the people, I must be what? Glorified. So Aaron held his peace. You betcha. He wasn't, he wasn't going to say nothing. Then Moses called Michelle and Esophon, whatever, and the sons of uh, Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp, the ones that died. So they went near and carried them by their tunics out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said to Aaron and Elzer and Ethamar, his sons, do not uncover your heads, nor tear or nor tear your clothes, lest you what? Lest you die. Why? Because what they did was wrong. It's called strange fire or profane fire, what they offered up. Because they were out of order. And <clears throat> lest you die and wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, be Bewail the burning which the Lord has kindled. 
You shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is what? Upon you. In other words, stay planted, he was telling them. And they did according to the word of Moses. Then the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink, you or your sons, with you, when you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, that you may distinguish between what? Holy and what? Unholy and between unclean and clean. And that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord had spoken to them by the hand of Moses. So in this as priests, because we are planted and we are to be called priests, we are to distinguish between what is holy, unholy, clean, unclean. Amen. What is true in error. What is of God and what is not of God. What is this timing? We are to distinguish those things. And we're to do that by knowing his voice. And this is what God trains us up to do. Remember Samuel as a child. What did the Lord do? He sent him with a prophet. Amen? Now the prophet was out of order, wasn't he? Eli was out of order. His sons were out of order. But still, because Samuel was planted where God told him to be planted, do you understand that? Even though the head was out of order, because of the obedience of Samuel being planted where he was supposed to, he was going to glean off of Eli. But I'll grow him. Amen? So God raised up Samuel to take Eli's place. And Eli's sons were profaning the tabernacle. And the Lord warned him, do something with your sons. And Eli didn't. His sons were killed. Eli died, and they lost the Ark of the Covenant. And it went into the hands of the Philistines. They lost the presence of God. So everybody got that because they were out of order. But Samuel was obedient to stay planted where he was supposed to be. And in this, God raised him up to replace Eli. And he became not only a judge and a prophet, but the sword of the Lord. Is everybody all right? Praise God. Now, so we see here in this profane or strange fire, what had happened was, is they ate strange, they ate junk food, didn't they? Amen? And because they ate junk food, it promoted what? Rebellion. Amen? Now listen, there is a cure to rebellion. It's called death. That is the only cure. <laughs> now, uh, like-mindedness will diffuse it. But to cure it is death. And that means death to yourself. Amen? It means death to what? Yourself. Because self is the one that promotes rebellion. So God is trying to get us into that place where we are like-minded with the Spirit so we can be like-minded with each other. But it takes planting. Amen? 1 Corinthians 3. Or you can only drink milk so long. Then it becomes junk food. It's the same thing with a baby. The reason why a baby drinks milk is because it's got nothing to chew with. Amen? But in this, as a child grows more, teeth come and so now they're able to digest things. You know, when the Lord started this ministry, he said, I would put meat in a bottle. 
They might not get it right away, but it'll all come as a puzzle as they continue. That's just the hand of the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1, let's read it together. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now you are not able to receive it, even now you are still not able. Well, this is, okay, when somebody is still drinking milk that is supposed to be eating meat, it becomes junk food. Are you listening? Hallelujah. For you are still carnal, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like what? Mere men. For one, one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am Apollos. Are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I what? Planted, Apollos, watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who what? Gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are what? One, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he what? How he builds on it. So there is the plant when you are planted. In other words, even this is where the word says that they're always learning, 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 never coming to the truth. And then it talks about that they can't grow any further. Amen? Because they're not staying planted. Because if you are planted where God tells you to be planted, and, and he also will eventually tell you to be uprooted. Has everybody got it? He can tell you to be uprooted, but you better make sure that you got confirmation. He can tell you to be uprooted. Why? Because there, there are places in, in the body of Christ that will just feed milk to get people going. Has everybody got it? Then there are places that feed me. But everybody has its part. It doesn't mean that one is better than the other. But it's the stepping stone. It's like the three chambers of the tabernacle. There are places that only talk about salvation. That's it, because it's outer court. Then there are places that talk about the spirit of God and fulfilling priesthood. And there are places that talk about the most holy place where you become a warrior. So that's different. Amen? Is everybody okay? But it doesn't make one place better than the other. Amen? But I believe right now God is trying to bring like-mindedness where all places become warriors. Because it's time to stand up. If these waves that are coming in are releasing weapons and strategies and tactics, only those that are in the spirit will be able to grab them and use them. Amen? So again, we are planted. You, there's watering and there's increase. There's planting, watering, and increase. So it's going to take three things. It's going to take discipline, consistency, and faithfulness. It's going to take what? Discipline, consistency, and faithfulness. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter two, verse one. Let's speak it together. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to who? 
faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So who are going to these things to be committed to? Well, why are they faithful? Because they're planted. Amen. And they are maintaining consistency, discipline, and faithfulness. You, therefore, must endure what? Hardship. Is hardship suffering? Welcome to the earth. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus. Wait a minute. You mean a soldier is going to suffer? <laughs> you, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Oh, if that could be understood. That he may please him who enlisted him as a what? As a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. So God is looking for faithful people. Those who are planted, they will increase. The law of the house of God is called faithfulness. The law of the house of God is called faithful. Everybody got it. That is one of his laws. That's, that is so needed. He is looking for people that are faithful. He doesn't care your abilities. He doesn't care what you can do. Because he's not looking at what you can do. He's looking at those who are faithful. So he can work through them. See, those who are faithful are dead. There are the called, the chosen, and the faithful. There is the called, the chosen and the faithful. It's the three chambers of the tabernacle. Outer court, holy place, most holy place. Luke 16. Again, God is not can, he's not looking at your faithfulness of abilities or talents or things that you've done. He's looking at your faithfulness. How faithful are you? Wouldn't you rather be with someone that is faithful because you can trust them even though they make mistakes? Amen. I would rather work with someone that is faithful because if they're faithful, they're honest. And what they're going to do is say, you know, I made a mistake. Okay, cool. Let's fix it. They show up at work. They do whatever. They're faithful, so if they make a mistake, it's cool. Because you know that they're going to end up learning, aren't they? Because they're faithful. Amen? It doesn't matter what trade of work you're in. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for whether you come to work, you show up on time, and you give your 100%. You know, and that you're the same way in front of the boss <laughs> as when... Your boss isn't there because your boss is always there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Luke 16. You know, it's amazing to me because, you know, after I'd gotten saved and I was uh, out working and stuff, and I, w I, w I was painting and construction and so forth, and, and um, and the, and the Lord sent me to this place, and the, I was with these guys, and we were painting this school and so forth, and they were believers. And it was incredible to me that when the boss was gone and how they changed. And they changed. They would sit around and whatever and go out and huff. They were huffers, cigarettes, you know, and so forth. They wanted more cigarette breaks, and they did you know working and it kind of blew me away in certain areas just because of the difference that they were claiming that, in other words there was no relationship and I kept my mouth shut for a period of time because <coughs> I had to wait and then the, the Lord shared with me about something that I blessed each and every one of them with something and it brought a conviction to them and it was a writing and, and a gift 
And in this, it brought reality to them about relationship with the Lord. And, I, and the Lord told me it was time for me to leave there. And when I left there, it, it, it would be a few weeks later that I started getting letters from some of them and sharing about what the gift was and so forth and how it convicted them. But it made them realize the area of the relationship with the Lord, questioning whether they really did have one. Because if you're different in front of people than behind people, you don't have a strong relationship with the Lord at all. Amen? In Luke 16, in verse 10, it says, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can t serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. In other words, you cannot eat junk food <laughs> and expect to serve God. Amen? Hallelujah. Matthew 25. You know, many people, unfortunately, money is their God. <clears throat> their success is the most important thing to them. They are more faithful according to the things of the world than they are the things of God. And they cannot trust, God cannot trust them. And it's because they are truly not planted. Planted is an area where you earn trust. You're faithful. Planted. God plants us. It is so essential to know the planting of the Lord and understand that. In Matthew 25 and verse 22. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you'd be a hard man, reaping where you have not sowed and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But as the Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. You ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servants into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we want to be known as a profitable servant. In other words, profitable in the spiritual riches. Amen? You cannot be profitable. Profitable means you are bearing more fruit. Amen? You are bearing more fruit. To be faithful is to be profitable. It's spiritual riches. Faithful out of the planting because you have been planted. People who are unfaithful are not planted. They have a sense of being planted, but they're really not. Amen? Listen, when that it happens, if when a person is unfaithful in planting, they're unfaithful in prayer. They're unfaithful in fellowship. They're unfaithful in sowing. They're unfaithful in vows that they make. They're unfaithful in their duties. In fact, they're untrusting. Psalm 1.
Psalm 1. Is everybody there? Let's speak this together. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. In other words, who does not eat what? Junk food. Ungodly counsel is junk food. Nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall what? Prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Revelation 2. Revelation 2 and verse 8. Jesus says, I know your works. See. Oh. Revelation 2 verse 8. And the angel of the church in Samaria write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your what? I know your what? Your works. Your what? Tribulations and poverty. But you are what? Why are they rich? Because they're planted. <laughs> and I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a what? Synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to what? Suffer. Hallelujah. It's for your training. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. Now, people think that, uh oh, going to jail. No, prison is captivity. That you may be what? Tested. So, what happens when you go into captivity? You're tested. And what are you going to do? You're going to stay planted. You're not going to run, you're going to fight. Oh, hallelujah. And you will have what? Tribulation 10 days. What does he say? Be faithful until what? Be faithful until you die. When you die, you come out of captivity. Has everybody got it? <laughs> and then I'm going to give you a crown of life. <laughs> In other words, that's a reward. You know, so many times people get all bonkers when God tests them. Oh, my God, what have I done? It's a test from the eternal broadcasting system. You know, the first thing somebody thinks is that they've done something wrong. Well, if they have, I hope they repented. At least it will give the opportunity for them to search themselves out. But we shouldn't wait till we get tested to search ourselves out. That should be every morning and every night in every decision. What's my motive? Why, what decision, the decision am I making, is it pleasing God or pleasing myself? Amen? Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, glory. Go to Deuteronomy 7. You know, God's desire, first of all, is that as we are faithfully planted, that we bear more fruit. Amen? And he says he prunes the fruit. That's called crush. 
so they can bear more fruit. So when you get thrown in captivity, it's not because you've always done something bad. It's because you're being tested to see if you're willing to die. And when you die, you're released. <laughs> See, we're not supposed to fight for our life. We're supposed to surrender. We're fighting for his life, not ours. Amen? In Deuteronomy 7 and verse 1, would you speak this with me? When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess and they have cast out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Jezreelites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Parasites and the Hivites and Jezebites and seven nations greater <laughs> and mightier than you. Now, now listen, these are all offsprings of darkness. That's why he was killing them all. He said, I want you, I'm going to move them out of there. Because I'm giving you the land that I promised your fathers. And when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall what? Conquer them and utterly what? Destroy them. Now, we, look it. These were offsprings of darkness. These were tribes that were totally against the things of God demonic forces but we have unseen forces don't we we're not going around killing men anymore although there's wars going on and whatever but that's not our war our war is spiritual amen so it's our responsibility to move out these spirits isn't it it's our responsibility to change the atmosphere and remove those spirits he says look at he's going to deliver them over to us the thing is, is when it begins to deliver them over to us, you're not to run. You're to destroy them. Amen? You shall make no covenant with them, nor shall show mercy to them. Nor shall you make marriage with them. That's unevenly yoked, isn't it? Amen? That's why a believer should not marry an unbeliever. It causes problems. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. I would not approve my daughter to marry an unbeliever. Wouldn't say I wouldn't, I'm not going to stop loving her if she chooses to. That's her decision. But she's going to have to work it out. But I would not give my approval or my blessing, no matter who, unless it's been approved by my father and his son. <laughs> Hallelujah. For they will turn your sons away from following me. Do you understand that? To serve other gods like themselves. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. But thus you shall deal with them. You shall destroy their what? Altars. This is now the altars and break down their sacred pillars this is spiritual warfare and cut down their wooden images and burn their carved images with fire so you're going to call fire down on these places aren't you for you are a holy people to the lord your god the lord your god has chosen you to be a people for himself a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth the Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you are more number than any other people, for you are the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Therefore, Know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. And he repays those who hate him to their face to destroy them. 
He will not be slack with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore, you shall keep the commandment, the statutes and judgments, which I command to you today to observe them. This is powerful. Again, in this, the planting of the Lord. He's the one who plants. He's the one who waters. And he's the one who increases. So be careful. Take heed in how you build. Take heed. Discern what you hear. Make sure you're not eating junk food. Amen. We don't need milk. There is no more milk. There's no time for milk. It's meat. It's all meat now. There's not enough time on the earth for milk. It's meat. So we want to be planted. Amen. Even Jesus told them that the fruit of the tree would be your meat from now on. Amen. So let's get planted. Let's get water. Let's grow. Let's eat meat. <laughs> Remember, we cut the heads of the giants off, right? <laughs> Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. We're honored and blessed. And Lord, we ask for your forgiveness in any area where we've defiled our planting, where we've eaten junk food and it's contaminated us, where we're unfaithful, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for uprooting and moving each and every one of us. We thank you for the food that you give us, for you provide. And wherever we're planted, you provide abundance. So, Lord, keep us. Keep us in the place hidden secretly with you. Continue to cover us with your wings and establish us that we would be sons and daughters that please you. Strong in the Lord, mighty warriors of the King of glory, serving the commander of all commanders, Jesus the Christ, in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Hallelujah.